I have five elements of a revegetation program. I'm going to take that one, make it easy for you. You got an idea, that's what people pay me for. And you have plant materials. Plant materials are important, they have to be matched to the, the climate and, and so on. Um, and actually, to all aspects of the environment. If you have transplants, you, you, know, you have to inspect them for quality. <clears throat> the next is implementation. And of all these five, I'm going to tell you, that's where things usually go sour. When, when we have failures, it's most often implementation that's done wrong. And <clears throat> you have luck. Does it rain? Does it not rain? You have two dry years, whatever. And I used to just say four, and now we have one more, and it's maintenance. And the maintenance basically means weed control. Um, if there ever was a thing of classical succession, it's been replaced by successive weeds of, or successive waves of noxious weeds coming through. All right. How about, how about if you guys give me three examples of habitat, plant habitat? What is it? Let's say hydrology. Okay. And what's soils? What soils? So soils have a lot of characteristics, but if we're actually defining a habitat. So the most important thing in soils usually is particle size or texture. But then you could get into soil chemistry and a bunch of different aspects, right? One more, just so we all know what we're thinking about. What? Huh? And climate in the big picture, right? And, and Butte's a pretty cold spot. But the interior of the United States is a cold spot too, so we're usually pretty safe bringing plants in from North Dakota, but we're not safe bringing them in from Libby, right? So you have to match up these things for, for habitat. <clears throat> and habitat's gonna be big in this too, so how would you learn about the affinities for plants, species for habitat? Huh? Look what you got. Look what you got. Well, yeah. Would you do that in an afternoon or Okay, I, from, from my experience, and I do have one claim or distinction, however minor. I think I've probably done more revegetation monitoring than anybody in Montana. I can't think who would be my next competition. Okay, <clears throat> when you're doing a baseline, that's how I got started, the baseline for coal. Believe me, by the time you're done doing a baseline, you know all the plants and you know where they grow. Okay, that's one way to do it. Or you can actually do a study. So when we look here, and we just said that two of the most important Habitat features are going to be hydrology and subsplits is called substrate or particle size. Part the different texture is for the fine earth fraction. If you throw in like pea gravel, cobbles or something, we'll call it particle size. Generalize it a little bit. So I'm going to pass this around. <coughs> a pretty cool study that Tom Keck, if any of you know, and this has <coughs> hydrology, particle size, and then the height of the graphs is the plants. And I put a a couple notes on here so you'd see like what's a broadly adapted one, what's a wetland plant, it couldn't care less what the texture is as long as it's wet, you know. And, and uh, some of them you'll see could be wet and coarse or somewhat drier on a finer texture, so, so there's an interplay between those two. Also, if anybody came here and they said, holy cow, this isn't what I thought this was going to be, I brought you Bob Dorn's Growing Native Plants in a Rocky Mountain Area. Some, anybody here wants to look at this? Or my, there you go. I, I knew at least one person was going to be here and say, "Holy cow, is this what you're going to talk about all the time?" All right. Oh, and one, I'll just pass this around to you. This is a monitoring report. So we do a monitoring report every year. I couldn't find a 2013. Okay. So we kind of know what habitat is. It's the the physical and chemical elements of the plant environment, okay? So it's physical and chemical elements of the plant environment. How about this? I'm not going to spend much time on it. Somebody give me one or two examples of niche for plants. What is it? That's a habitat. That's the, ha the error that's made, most often made. I can't hear so. Canopy? Um, you could. If you said like shading, the plant that you're right on the verge because you're uh, it could be sh it could be shading from a cliff, but it's still shading to the plant whether it comes from other plants. So so I say yeah, you could say something like that 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 could be. But ha so what is niche different from habitat? If everybody confuses it, the, the niche is the way that the to be specialized in a community. Okay, 
be specialized in a plant community. So if you had a monoculture, there is no nature. It's pure habitat, right? That's all there is. So it's a way to be specialized in there. So now you know that. Give me just one other example of niche so I know we're all thinking one. We got a habitat. We got a couple species growing there. Well, they could be, it could be temporal, right? It could be the time of year that the plants start growing or flower and stuff like that. Could be rooting depth, same habitat, right? But they're using a different part of the, that habitat. Okay. I was going to, oh, this is cool. What's the unit of flora or taxonomy? Oh, come on, y'all know this one. What's the unit of the flora? Just somebody said it. it's a species, right? It's a species. Okay. What's the unit of vegetation? This is something I don't expect everybody to know. It's the plant community. The plant community is the unit of vegetation. What's the unit of diversity? Well, of course, there is none. There is no unit of diversity. But if you had one, what would you like it to? What would be properties that you would like? You would like each each category to be pretty much equally different. This is why the problem with using species. Of course, they're not equally different. They're not equally important. They're not equally anything. A French ecologist calls it the species vortex. We're all sucked in. This is where we usually fetch up using species, but we all know that it's not the best thing. And now, just for fun, what's the unit of habitat? There's no unit again. So how do you know habitat? Well, you perceive what you think is a habitat, but the plants really determine how many habitats are distinguished. You follow that? So the plants themselves are going to tell you how many habitats they, and of course, if some new species come in, then they might say, no, there's really yet another habitat that can be partitioned out of that. Oh, I hope I'm not boring you. This is just to get everybody thinking in the right line here. One last, this is tough, but I don't think you guys think about this a lot. What orders plant communities? Orders. What orders plant communities? Disturbance could. That's that's I mean that's a totally okay answer. What else? Um, that's a habitat factor. So any habitat factor to some extent in that it provides stress or whatever could order plant communities. Well, I can't believe you guys everybody says competition. That's the thing. People love to say that when it comes to plants. They spend their whole lives trying to avoid competition and it suits me talk, but you didn't do it, so I can't I can't blame you. So it, it could be uh, competition, it certainly could be stress. It gets complicated because they interact, for example, if we were going to say moisture, to use your example there, uh, competition usually takes place in when resources are fairly abundant and plants are pretty densely packed, which could be spring here. And of course, they're using these resources differentially. But as it gets drier and drier, it gets to the point where it doesn't matter how many neighbors there were because only very few can now live in the amount of uh, moisture that's now left, right? So you can see an interaction. Okay, that's just to get you thinking the right way. Last thing, what's a trend? You got as good an answer as me. So I'm supposed to be talking about trends. Tell me what's a trend. Yeah, something in time. But when you hear it, doesn't it sometimes, don't you think, it's a half-baked generalization that lacks all data and rigor. And say, oh, really? That's, because that's what sometimes I, I hear somebody say that, and I just think, oh, you don't really have any clue, you know, what's going on. Or it could be a temporal, you know, directional changes. So what's so hard about trends? It's a hard topic to talk about. The first thing is it takes time to even have, identify them, right? So the first thing we're going to talk about is 10 years old. That's just the beginning of seeing what a trend could be is 10 years old. So that's a big limitation. How about, oh, I have to give an anecdote I love to tell. Somebody from DEQ, I gave a talk, and I, used to, I attended all those buildings thing and gave presentations from the 70s till the last one in 2009. And this guy gets up in his wildlife and he says, we don't have any actual data. But me and this other guy, just a wildlife consultant, we think that the recovery of wildlife after coal mining is like this, and it's the old sigmoid curve, okay? At which point somebody leaned over to me and said, 
Ask him if he has the original cocktail napkin that they drew that on. OK, that's one way that I'm afraid trends get used. They're lacking of all, all data and, and rigor. So <clears throat> if we just took one example out of today, uh, the sage hens, you know, that's a big issue in Montana. And what Montana would like to show in one brief year, really, if they could, is that they're addressing the problem and the population's improving. So what's the problem? Why can this not, it can't be done. It won't, you know, well, of course, they totally ignored it forever, you know, and, and what they appointed a sage hen biologist a year ago or something when they, when, you know, the, the ax was already coming down. So these trends, they're pretty, they're pretty hard to tease out. I didn't get into why. And the reason why is <clears throat> sage hens fall uh, precipitation almost as much as plants do. Wet years have a lot of sage hens. I hunt sage hens, and, and, and I've certainly tried to explore the habitats. So uh, trends can be pretty hard to tease out of the annual dynamic. Every year is different than every other year. Every year has different plant quantities than every other year. So it, it becomes kind of difficult. So you want to, you need at least a couple data points there to even pretend that you're seeing a trend and not just some kind of uh, noise, really, in the system. So with that, I'm going to start my timer. And we're going to start to talk about Silver Bow Creek. And that's a picture up in Reach A. We're going to talk about trends. Reach A means right up here by Butte. Starts up by Butte, ends where uh, Silver Bow Creek goes under the interstate uh, after the Anaconda exit there and goes through a big line power over on the side. Everybody has to throw in obligatory wildlife. All right. It turns out a lot of people don't remember, and some of you weren't here. What did Silver Bow Creek look like? So we're up in uh, pretty almost to the beginning. And this here is the, you know, Buttes over here. That's the, the uh, interstate coming in there. And this is where the rest stop is. Now there's a, or a parking lot, I guess I'd say. You know, and the trail goes down here, crosses down in here. And if you see the white color, then it's really barren, OK? Why would it be white? Well, we'll see in a little bit. Salt. Usually, if it was white, it was salt. And we'll get to that. But if you see this color here, what does that mean, do you think? It's, it's some adapted species. It's, it's tufted hair grass. So what we have along the stream, we have uh, red top, or colonial bent grass, and a lot of this tan grass, and then some really raw spots like that. OK, so we're oriented on that photo, I think. And we're going to go downstream a little now. So this is rocker. I know it's shocking. You know, the town pump isn't there. And actually, a whole lot of stuff isn't there. But I'm just wanting to show you the levels of contamination. So we have a pretty contaminated system here. Some old willows, those willows are old baby. They were, they were growing there before the sediments came in, OK? And when you see them, there's a lot of dead ones in there. So I remember when somebody from MSU said something about them, them growing there. And I said, they're just buried there. That, they're just buried. They're actually rooted in somewhat cleaner dirt. Let's see if there's anything else on that one. Now we get down to where the sediment really fell out. Now, oh, I should have. I thought everybody kind of knew. but So this came from, from uh, Mine waste released from viewed at the turn of the 20th century, early 1900s. And uh, it was kind of raced through those first. But now um, Ramsey is right up here. There's Ramsey sewage treatment there. This is Brown Sculch Creek. These are some of the original wedge demonstration things that ARCO put in when they were trying to say that we didn't have to remove the waste. When ARCO wanted to do this, there wasn't going to be very much waste removal at all. And I have to say, and it's due to NRD program that funded the removal that you know that took this from being a bunch of lime contamination. So there's some of the first ones. And we're gonna look right here, right at that spot where Brown's Gulch is coming down. And now we're gonna switch to the ground view. So we're looking north up Brown's Gulch, that's the willows there. There's the uh, rarest line. And to the right over here is Butte. All that stuff is coming down. This is my scenario. Probably at the same time, brown sculpt is, is flooding as well. And so these sediments sit there, and they're re-entrained, and away they go. So to the native eye, 
not the native, the untrained eye, that you might think that looks clean. Um, you might think it's a little bit fishy that there's no plants, you know, along the edge, but certainly compared to these deep, deep tailings. So uh, one to two meters uh, deep, in, and that would be the most contaminated part. So all that sediment fell out. That's just to show, that's uh, where Brown's Gulch comes in now under the rarest line. And it's not on that oxbow because the stream's been moved, but um, let's see. I know we got some plant people here. You have to shout at me. Buffalo berry. Yeah. Buffalo berry. A little tough to hear. Those are all buffalo berries back in there. And to finish it off, <clears throat> everybody I think knows the yellow ditch. So we're down to the Fairmont Road here. And I think we're seeing less white and more tough to hair grass. So it's not quite as contaminated, but still quite a bit. And for the last photo, oh, these were 88, September 88 photos. <laughs> and this is the highway one into Anaconda. The interstate's just right on the edge there. And <clears throat> down here, instead of having concentrated mine waste, it's probably distributed across the floodplain. Just for comparison, that's the Clark Fork, phase one. That's just below, just right over here is the ponds. And it's not quite fair to compare because the governor's project uh, treated some areas in here. All the same, it's not the same level of contamination. And it definitely looks better farther downstream. Now, you guys have driven down the interstate many times. It doesn't look anything like Silver Bowl Creek used to look. There's some mine waste up close. The blue color denotes copper. The salts denote lack of plants, basically. So the soluble salts uh, come up to the surface through capillary rise after they go down with precipitation and come back up. Now you'd think if somebody was very smart that they would know that salt was going to be an issue in revegetation. But I thought that was just part of the contamination picture. And hey, this is Western Montana. This is an Eastern Montana salt flat, is it? Uh, picture and reach H, which means it's uh, up above uh, Miles Crossing, between Miles Crossing and Silver Bow. And one down in reach R, and back there, that's opportunity. But you're looking across the road, it's kind of diagonal. So there's the statistics. A lot of mine waste removed, not really a ton of acres. And to the credit of DEQ and Joel Chavez, and it's way under budget, which seems like a miracle when we first started it. Now, this mechanism doesn't apply to this, but the point is you establish a per permanent vegetative cover. <clears throat> and so time is going to be a, a variable. And that time should be long, but our careers are short. So as there's a compromise of 10 years, you know, so whatever you think of that. Um, I'll tell you right now, the interest is, it's not even on Silver Bowl Creek. It's on, who, where did the governor go last year? To Clark Fork to see what? Some dirt being moved. Okay, but that's how it always is. The new project gets the emphasis and the old project, whatever, you know. So habitat, what do you see here? Pure raw habitat, that's how it starts, right? We see two substrates. We see some kind of in situ material and cover soil. We see some ponds, so we know there's going to be hydrology. The stream's over in here. Those are going to be the big habitat factors. But this is how it starts, how it looks when we start the reveg. <clears throat> so we're going to look at D and E. They were seeded and planted in 2003 and about 90 acres. So this is a place that I have enough data to conclude something. We had standards. I wrote the standards or made them up. Hey, you know, who's got more experience to do it? And here's how Reach's DNA came in. So way, way high in the sub. This is plant cover. Way high on the, on the uplands. Uh, higher somewhat there. And, and even though I set wetlands at 100%. And the reason you get over 100% is <clears throat> by measuring the plants individually through the layering, then you can get a higher number. You can get a really high number, really, if you have willows over dense sedges or something like that, you can get close to 200%. If you had cottonwoods over willows, you know, you can go on like that. Okay, <clears throat> the bottom sentence. Let's look at the revegetation. Now, anybody can cherry pick. I could make it look good. I could make it look terrible. I could make it look so horrible that you couldn't believe it. These are my monitoring transects. They're unbiased, so it's just run through them real quick. What does it look like? Okay, 
here's I guess two things you can take out of here today and say we really remember this from Rich Prodgers. You got to match plants and habitat, and the revegetation is the soils map. That's the second one. The revegetation is the soils map. So what do you see here on this transect? I'll tell you what I see. I see a salty soil that has a sparse cover of alkali grass and some basin wild rye. The alfalfa here is invisible in front. And so I see the a salt affected soil that's lowered the plant cover here. But it's not, you can, you, it's, you can vegetate it, but that, that would be like, I don't think that would quite make the 60% plant cover. Anyway, this is how I interpret. I'm not going to do it on every photo. I just wanted to show you. I think you can understand this one. <laughs> What's interesting here is that A, we did have revegetation on it and it died. And B, we often have that kind of line where you can straddle the contamination line, which I wish I had time to go in to tell you why that makes it difficult to sample and so on for, <clears throat> for this. Because point data isn't very indicative of what goes on when you have this kind of patterns where it just no transition. The next sample has nothing to do with it. So Krieging tells you nothing. OK, I have some little notes on here. You can probably read them to better than me. The main, the dominance there are basin wild rye and uh, creeping meadow fescue and alfalfa. Uh, there's a, both a seeding boundary and I would say not the best dirt in the world right there. Two thirds basin wild rye, one third or one fifth uh, creeping meadow foxtail. Oh, this, this is one where in 2009 at 4% creeping meadow foxtail. In 2013, 64%. So that's going to be one of the stories today. In the meantime, today, species richness declined from 19 to 11. This is an introduced species that, I, that wasn't seeded there at all. So that's a very invasive, displacing species. 60% basin wild rye, 30% alfalfa there, a jungle. A basin, uh, that's one of our borrow areas. And <coughs> That's a very simple seeding of uh, Russian wild rye, which they were introduced, Russian wild rye and sheep fescue, and actually um, alfalfa too. But very, it's so competitive. This is about as weed resistant a plant community as you can have. You do almost no weed control on that. So uh, it's certainly not a bastion of diversity, but if you just want to control weeds, Russian, they're all fierce underground competitors. And there it was. Uh, so uh, did I make that point there that, that the uh, sheep fescue has increased greatly and the uh, Russian wild rye has decreased? And there's how it looked in 2009 when it was mainly Russian wild rye. Uh, another part of a borrow area seeded with a more, one of my more typical mixes. A railroad bank up here that's mine waste in, in part of the channel area. This is a place that Greg knows well. Um, we had severe salt problem here, very severe. The cover was 38% in 2006. Remember, there was, it was done in 2003. And it's come along. This is one of the places that, so I planted, or had planted, the uh, Baltic rush crosswise in strips, because you don't have enough plants to do it solid. So in other words, a crossways to the flow in case it flooded there. And in the early days, this was a lot of alkali grass. But now those, they're actually very important. There's some basin wild rye there. And uh, it looks like that's a golden current. That's a little off. But we have buffalo berry and some uh, narrow leaf willow there. Another kind of a jungle, which by 2013 was two thirds creeping uh, metal fox. So remember, we didn't seed that. And I'm like, no time to go into methods too much. <clears throat> but 100 meter transects are really good because they get you past the aberrations. First of all, if you were trying to cheat, it's very hard to cheat with a 100 meter transect. You know, it's really hard to, to do anything with a 100 meters, so lay it out and measure it. <clears throat> and uh, do 20 half, meters, uh, half meter square plots, half meter by one meter plots, and shrub density. So let's talk about the trends. Well, <clears throat> The moister the site, the greater the change. So I hate to say this for the guys who, uh, who wear the pointy hats and they're the wetland specialist and no one else 
can understand, only they know the sacred knowledge, you know. The reality is these are the areas that don't have to be as successful as, as well done the first time because they come along pretty good. And I'll show you when we get to a picture of it. Now there's, I call it a swamp. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, that was one salty son of a gun and it looked like it was gonna be pretty ugly. Look at that, isn't that something? There's another angle on it. I might be too close, I was, I'd like to help you. Uh, there's, that's Buffalo Berry, the creek's right back in there and there's a pond on, on the other side there. That's uh, Seaside Arrowgrass, Triglocken, Maritima there. And uh, probably Baltic Rush there. It's a they're a little fuzzy at that size for me to see. Here's a place, I, this may not be funny to you, but I thought we were gonna have to leave this kid there. I thought if we hooked him up to a four putt, we might pull him apart, you know? He went out into the quicksand, and I have you guys done this, gone out? You know, there's a point where all you can do is move your legs a couple inches, and ain't nobody coming up, you know? And you get like, and that's what happened to him. And how that, and this is a professional, this is an MCC kid. That professional planner, I thought, well, now it'll be two, you know, that story. And son of a gun, he, he got him out of there somehow. And there's that spot now. So that's what I'm saying. You, if you have a decent wetland, things are probably going to turn out pretty good. We don't plant uh, cattails, but they do come in. And another trend I told you earlier, and that's if you're waiting for things to get better on themselves in an upland, you're, basically you're going to just see which weeds come in next. So let's turn to trends. So here we have perennial. Perennial plants live more than one year canopy coverage, and it went up, and then it kind of came down. So yeah, when I show these slides, you might always take a quick glance over here. So this one starts at zero, so it's, it's probably pretty intuitive to you. So why did, it come, why did it come down? Well, precipitation doesn't look like that explains it too well. So I would say that's not a real comforting graph, but it's still, it's still up above the uh, standards to pass, but I don't, I know I'm crazy about that. <clears throat> now, when I show you that graph, you say, oh, ain't that simple. Okay, here's how it actually looks. These are all those numbers of those places that we looked at each slide, each transect down here, and those are the three years. And so, although we can say that 2009 was usually the high year, but you could have uh, an example where it isn't the high year, or <clears throat> I know there's one in there, I can't see it right now. There's one where, where it actually goes down Oh well, I'm in the wrong spot to get a good look at it. <clears throat> so anyway, it's all pretty noisy, and it's only when we get this into a generalization that it, it, it looks simple to you, like, oh yeah, it went up and went down. So uh, perennial uh, coverage. Oh, I'm sorry, and I saw, since we've just shown this increase in the first years, and I wanted to substantiate it, so I switched to a different place. F and G, and it, and it shows you that we do usually get a pretty good increase between like years three and six. So we're going to look now at some individual species. So that one there, that means basin wild rye, that means creeping fescue and alfalfa. We're actually just looking at the, the basin wild rye, which to your eyes is that giant bunch grass in there. And we're going to look at its close relative, this one with the, the droopy inflorescence, that's Canada wild rye. And then that's somewhere else. In the second year, you'll see why in a second. So we look at the green, that's the basin wild rye, and that's one of our, we could say winners, that's one of our ones that seems to do good with time. Actually pretty strong. And the Canada wild rye diminishes greatly with time. So uh, that's one trend. Here's one that's uh, slender wheatgrass and both Canada wild rye and basin wild rye and some alfalfa, but we're going to focus on the slender wheatgrass in here. And slender wheatgrass, <clears throat> that's a kind of a slow decreaser. So easy to establish, virtually jumps out of the ground when we see it. Has some salt tolerance, that's all good. But it, when we look at the temporal trend, it's down for that. Now, this is bottle brush squirrel tail here with, uh, that's Canada wild rye and this is bottle brush squirrel tail in a much more recent seeding. <clears throat> the fact that they go down 
that doesn't mean that that's a loser or bad. They could be important in those first years. And this, sh this shows you partly why. For one thing, that green plant is the kochia suppressed by these quick starters. And obviously, it's going to have a big effect on the underground system because everything is driven by primary productivity. And when you have, oh, like here, probably two and a half tons per acre of productivity in that first year, that really gets the system going. So it's not like I'm saying you should see this because this does good and you shouldn't see this. No, <clears throat> think about uh, how you look at it when it's not in revegetation. Well, then you're very prone to bring in temporal trends and, and how things change through time. And yet most people, when they do a seeding, they say, walk away, we're done, that's that, right? And that's how most of the, the revegetation is done. So we talk about salt. I think we have to talk about salt. You can imagine when I went out to reach A, and I'm thinking, well, even back then, in 2002, I'm thinking, Blue Ribbon Trout Stream somewhere down the road here. And instead, I see something as bad as any of the things I, the salt flats I work with in eastern Montana. I love this slide. It's my favorite slide, but there's one blade of grass. See it there? <laughs> and if there's one, why not 10,000? So you learn how to do it. <clears throat> so this is a, a soluble salts that have come up. This is Rocky Mountain bee plant. And I got a grass here. It doesn't look like a wheatgrass, does it? It looks like kind of a, a flimsy grass. And that's going to be this part of the story is this is uh, alkali grass. So alkali grass can come right up in that kind of salt. That's a lot of salt. <clears throat> One of my favorite, oh, I'm not as mean as I used to be, but when people would cry about their saline soils, you know, and they had eight, eight millimoles per centimeter. And I said, you know, if you can't scrape it off with a teaspoon and fill a salt shaker, I'm not really that sympathetic to what you got because I know what it is to have salt. <clears throat> well, it's got me stumped. What is that picture? Oh, okay, I think. I can't see from where I'm at. Well, oh, that's the same spot. Sorry. I just took it the other day, and it's not green, so it threw me off the, what threw me off was the water. But that, if, right, I think right there was where that salty strip was. It goes back, that's the trail back there. This is just below the halfway to Rocker where that rest stop is. If it had been green, I would have known right away. Okay, that's alkali grass. That's a lot of alkali grass. And let's see what we identify here. We got alkali grass is the main one. We got, uh, there's some epilobium ciliatum there. There's some Aster ascendens, Scorpus maritimus. Uh, the kind of lewd looking one is the seaside arrow grass uh, and a lot of alkali grass there. Now, if, <clears throat> if you don't do this, if you can't revegetate it like using alkali grass, then it's going to stay white. And it's going to be inhibitory to anything that you see. So you have to take that first step and intercept that soil moisture and transpire it through the plant instead of having it come to the surface and bring the soluble salts. So it won't be a surprise when we see that this is another decreaser. But that sure doesn't mean it's not important because there's not a lot you can do in that first seeding with all the salt. OK? Let's switch to legumes. There's buffalo berry again. It's the shrub. What else can we see in there? There's a little red top down in there. But the yellow flower here, there's some slender narrow leaf willow. Um, so this is bird's foot trefoil. So trefoil, so that's T-R-E-F-O-I-L. But if you pronounced, and, and if clovers are trifolium, but if you pronounce them correctly, it'd be trefolium in Latin, and that's where trefoil come from. Now there's another little thing you know. Okay, so that's bird foot trefoil. And so we see those different, so it's gonna be kind of moist, right? Gonna be kind of moist, got willows, got, go ahead. Lumex? <laughs> Well, first of all, there's a lot of species in it. It's in Polygonaceae family. And uh, <clears throat> um, seed would be prohibitive. It, but you can buy little quantities of it if you wanted some, but not like we, 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 we buy stuff, yeah. Yeah. Somebody asked me once if I wanted to collect it, you know, make big money. <clears throat> OK, this one's alfalfa. There's our old buddy, the nodding inflorescence, Canada wild rye. That's the yellow-flowered alfalfa, which is a special drought-tolerant variety. And that's back to, to uh, 
trefoil, and this is trifolium, that's red clover down there and the grass. You should get to know that because I'll be harping on a little. That is that creeping fescue, once again, not feeded by me. Now, there is no reason for legume cover to decline. No good reason. So I don't, I think that's uh, cast a little question mark on the soil quality. There's no natural, there's no reason to say, oh, that's, that's natural. You should just your legume should drop out like that. And so I looked again to another, uh, and I only had two samples here because that's, that's younger, and you see the same thing. <clears throat> okay, now we go all the way back to reach A, the very top, and plant cover declined, and now it's only two, two data points. You know, if somebody says that's worthless, I, I wouldn't argue. But that's a, that's a pretty big difference there, isn't it? It's almost down to zero. So, um, I don't, I'll put it this way, there's certainly a questionable aspect to this, isn't there? It is to me. Okay, just an interesting anecdote. I hope it's interesting to you. That is a lot of alfalfa, baby. That's like five tons per acre. It's not exactly what I was going for, okay? I want that to be a member. I think that nitrogen fixation is a true miracle. We got dirt that comes out of a hole in the ground. There's no microorganism. It's wonderful to have some nitrogen fixation, but I didn't want it to look like an alfalfa field. And I seeded two and a half pounds per acre. So the first thing you think is, I seeded too much, right? I mean, two and a half pounds an acre isn't a lot, but I seeded too much. So I cut back and I seeded one and a half pounds per acre. And there's a plant. That's the only one you can see in that photo. Okay, so what's really going on? Well, the first photo was was came came up in 2010, which had like six inches of major precip, and the second one was in one of our dry years, and so it really wasn't what I seeded. It was those initial conditions that changed that. And believe me, by the time we got to here, I should, I wished I'd have seeded five pounds an acre, so I could have got a little bit of alfalfa in that field. Okay, there it is, Garrison creeping foxtail. Garrison's the cultivar name for it. And that's uh, in Reach H 2013. It wasn't seeded there and it's become a total monoculture. So this is our number one invasive and it's, it's something that uh, the Bridger Plant Material Center released in their wisdom, the NRCS. You know, people have this affinity for native plants. I remember we used to have a, a native plant chapter down in Dillon and remember um, something green, Debbie Green, something green, remember that gal from Force? And it would be talking about these introduced plants that she's selling and stuff at the Native Plant Society meeting. So there's just something seductive about it using introduced species. You don't have to do it. Okay, <clears throat> that is my main disappointment in the vegetation area, is that this has come in and taken over and it was seated up in, in uh, lower area one. And it's an act of ignorance and cowardice. I'm not gonna, I used to name everybody, all the morons that were responsible for this. But it doesn't matter, but, but what's the cowardice part? You have to have a little nerve and do your best. If I, now that, you gotta remember, back upstream there was very early. If I had failed twice, and the boss on this came to me and said, Rich, one more seeding and you're out, we're gonna have somebody new, maybe I'd have done this. But I sure as heck wouldn't have come in there and just seeded it the first thing. So, here's a stream bank. I, did I put the reach on it anywhere? But that's reach H anyway. <laughs> and let's see what we see here. Well, this big tall stuff, that's our, basically tarragon. The French variety is tarragon, the seasoning. And there's some yarrow there, and there's some silver sagebrush. And there's some cudweed sagewort, and there's some red clover. There's some alfalfa, there's some narrow leaf willow back there. Uh, that's actually off the bank, but that's Canada wild rye there. And that's creeping meadow fox tail, just a couple plants. Now, if you don't appreciate it, that's the work of a master seeder. And I'll admit it's me, but I'll tell you what, if, I saw, if, some, if you showed me that slide, I genuflect to the person that did that. You are not gonna see much work like that. And when we had the floods or the high flows or whatever, these banks without the willows absolutely held up just as good as the banks that had willows. And how many times have you heard that you need the willows for stability, you know? And I mean for the whole 15 miles that we had done. 
Here's a uh, uh, nearby, we'll just say, this is Canada milk veg, the buffalo berry, there's clover down in there. And now there's a lot more creeping meadow foxtail, okay. And our banks pretty much end up looking like this. So all my wonderful diversity is gone to be replaced by this. So that's kind of a tragedy to anybody that really uh, loves plants. So creeping metal foxtail, well, guess what? It wasn't present because I didn't seed it. And there it is, 4%, up to 25%. Um, still continuing, you know, if it can grow there. The species reduction, richness reduction, uh, that's from, this, from all the data. So that's unfortunate trend there is diversity de decreasing. There couldn't be reasons for that, but we don't have time to really go through it. And, and now I see that I have no prayer of doing this talk in a half hour as I'm right there. So we're going to do this. Off the, will you guys tell me when we're done what I'm going to cut to give this talk at Fairmont next week? But any of any of the relative abundance indices of, of uh, diversity, you're going to have two components. You're going to have the species, how many species are present, and what's the relative abundance, OK? So if you had five species and it was 96, 111, or 95, 1111, did I say five or six? OK, that's going to be a low number. OK, it's almost all one species. If you had five species and they were all 20, that would be the highest number you could get for five species. The only way you get a higher number is to have six species, then they'd all be 17s, OK? Yeah, so, so that's just how it works. So anyway, uh, a really big decline in equitability over there. And we have 270 vascular plant species. I think that's a little light. I'm going to have to um, take a look this year. I think it should be about 300. And uh, about 2,500 in Montana, 2,100 natives. They have about 11% of the vascular plant species in Montana. Shrubs, that's golden current from seed. It's garrison creeping foxtail. Uh, our buffalo, or our, our rabbit brush came from Wyoming. Now, a lot of times you take a gamble like that, it doesn't work out. These grew five times bigger than our native plants. You know, our native guys are like this. That's one of my sagebrush hand seedings. Uh, it's a little strip that we didn't get equipment into. That turned out pretty magnificent. You can't, this is. Big deal in coal, big deal. You might, might say, oh, sagebrush or whatever. That's, that's difficult to grow, and it's a, something of an achievement. So we look at shrub cover, slowly increasing. Yeah, probably not much more than bigger plants. In other words, it's not necessarily more plants. It's probably just the same plants getting bigger. And there's one that I think is kind of heartening. So there's our bear dirt coming down through the, the years to uh, less than 10%. So that's good. And now. The beavers are, have decided that they didn't like our model as much as we did. And uh, I got to give our guys, that's, that one was up in Reach A, and this one's in Reach B. And uh, so far, our guys, can you believe that we, we have algae this early in the year? That was, I just took that picture last week. Um, so anyway, things are, are changing. And one hopes for the good. The good news is we don't have any real wetland weeds to come and ruin that one when this is drained out and then there's a fresh raw substrate, that's where willows usually come in. And you know, that's the thing about, we're talking about temporal trends. Hey, we just scratched the surface here, you know, with 10 years. Um, well, especially with the, the people that like to transplant a lot, they want to try to make it look old and, and it's new, you know. But eventually they'll eat all the food and, and this will drain out and there'll be a fresh raw substrate. And if it's the right time of year in the spring, then it's going to get willow seed and turn it. But if it comes from a, an August uh, intense thunderstorm or something like that, no, then it's not. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to get sedges and grasses. Switching to, oh, we're not going to talk about that. That's my wife. That's a fish from silver bowl, though, yeah, a rainbow. Kind of a miracle, don't you think, Greg? Isn't it? We've, all of us did. I mean, it's just kind of a miracle that this dead stream. But instead, we're going to talk about birds. That's a harlequin duck. Uh, my buddy took that picture down in Yellowstone. We don't have harlequin ducks. Yeah, we do. We actually got a harling duck sighting on there. I, I can't remember who did it, but it might have been me, but somebody saw one anyway. So for those of you who came to see the birds, here you go. All right, so we're going to look at temporal trends here. We've got four sample years, and we have four months that we sample in a standard procedure, same points, same sequence, 
every time. So this is back up in sub-rear ones we're going to have the most. 2005 to 2013, so it's still only eight years. You look at this and say, I could kind of see a trend here, but I sure don't see a trend here. And this is the total number of birds, right? Now, but our total number of birds is strongly influenced by swallows and especially cliff swallows. So when I take out the cliff swallows, then the most recent year was the highest. And I think, I think it's a little bit aberration that they were that much higher that year. But it's still, I think we're seeing a general increase as the habitat develops. If we switch now and look at the species sampled, that's more clear that we're having a general increase through time. If we look at species per station, um, that is showing also kind of a, a general increase through time with the usual aberrations that you're going to see. And now we know what equitability means. And equitability, uh, you don't see much here. That's because we really don't have much change in those early species. That's really winter. That's March. You know, our March sampling is, is pretty bleak, really. But in the other months, we're seeing that the equitability. So remember, that means that we're seeing more even numbers among the different species. Of equitability among stations, well, there's sure no trend there, is there? There's no, no difference in that. OK, this is kind of interesting. Now, once again, even though there was a lot of points on that graph, it still was just four years, and it was just four months. OK? And this was just to show you what it would look like in just March, June 2013. And I put all the data together for the four months for the purpose of this graph. So we got a high point and a high point. And we're talking about the numbers, number of not species, but plant. I do everything with me as plants. It's the number of individuals. So what do you think is responsible for the high points? The rest of it's pretty uniform. Huh? Very good, Joe. Uh, this one is a wetland. That's Nisla wetland. Down, and then you just go on down to the end, and you're done. But there's another thing. Remember Cliff Falls? Bridges. It starts up by the interstate, and it goes under the interstate right by Nistler. So, so those are the two factors there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's a Nistler wetland. So there's 429 species supposedly in Montana. Uh, sub area one, we have uh, 98, or about one quarter of them. And for all of the stream sites so far, we have 128 or a little less than one third. So that's pretty, pretty impressive, I think, for the young age of it. All right. There's 36 minutes and 30 seconds, and I got 30 minutes the next time I give this talk. Hey, I had one more anecdote I just love to tell. I admire, don't you admire those people that give the same song and dance over and over? And every ad lib is polished, you know? I, there was one guy in the old days to give it, the slides had turned yellow. He's just, and by the last time he gave a talk, he was very old. And he used to say, and it makes you want to say, hooray for the kinopodes. That's a, a plant family. And by then, he was so feeble that you're like, oh, you know, it just made your heart ache to see him do this thing. But I have to make a new one every freaking time I do this, except I'm giving this talk next week uh, at Fairmont. So um, I don't know if you have questions, if you have any questions. And if not, you can tell me what. Go right ahead. Yeah, one question I was thinking. When you survey these birds, basically the area is narrow. Yes. Which we don't count. We don't count. And that's part of the protocol because you're exactly right. And and even even the landfill is going to cause flyovers of crows and ravens and stuff. So there's you're right. So they're supposed to be. And I leave this to Nate because at some point it's going to be a judgment call, especially in the canyon because the canyon is so thin, and there's coniferous forest and mountain mahogany and there's lots of other habitats. But the the instruction is that we try to disregard flyovers using the habitat, using the habitat that we created, exactly. There's lots of details I don't have time to get into, especially methods, because of the shortness. Anything else? Gina.
I don't know. I already know where you're going. <laughs> That's one of those things I think that falls in the category where I said it would really be hard to tease that out of, of the annual dynamic, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's another variable that it's the reason why um, we didn't do bird inventories before. You got to remember, we moved the whole channel. And so the floodplain hydrology shifted too. And so it's really hard to compare anything pre-remediation on a spot-by-spot -spot basis to what we had, yeah. And then I'm not sure what unit you would use because we lowered, in general, the floodplain. So the elevation at the surface when, you know, so you'd say, of course, the groundwater's shallower because there's not as much dirt on top of it as there used to be. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of pe times people ask me, um, hey, what are those salts anyway? And I said, does it really matter? <laughs> <laughs> we got a salt problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you're talking to the wrong guy because I did monitor Coal Strip for a bunch of years. They're cookie cutter. They're cookie cutter reclamation. Well, I, th I think that the trend of there, if you're just talking about diversity, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be lower and equilibrate there. And I, I said during the talk, I didn't have time to go into it, but of course, one reason is going to be uh, competitive exclusion, which is a, in places where, com where competition is important, which would tend to be our more moisture, which is where, where the creeping fescue took. I think that that's a little bit up in the air because I don't like seeing that trend. That trend of decreasing is not good. You know, we're, there's every degree. You never can clean it all up, you know. Joel says that all the time. And you can't, you can't always clean it up. <clears throat> but there, there could be some upward migration. There's something causing that plant cover to not be stable. It looks like it's going down, you know. I think we still need some more. And what could you do, I mean? You know, it's tough. Yeah. Talking about plants? Well, in uplands, very little. And I'm surprised that I had as many trends to show you in uplands. But in wetlands, we got migratory birds who carry seeds on all their tails and all their feet. And this is why some of this is funny. I, had, you know, I took this slide out because it's too ironic. Monkey see, monkey do. That's the model for revegetation. Monkey see, monkey do. So some other program, you know, right close to us, they, they want only local sedges and stuff. And I said, you know, those ducks can fly from Hudson Bay to the Gulf of Mexico in about a day. And I think if they stop, they're going to drop those propagules. And I don't think we're having a lot of, spe of specialization in that context. And it's also why the wetlands uh, kind of take care of themselves if you've got some water for, those, for them to come in. In the uplands, it's weeds. It's weeds. Oh, in wetlands? Oh, yeah. If I, yeah, there's stuff I didn't seed or plant where I said they had a picture of the swamp. There's, there's stuff I neither seeded nor planted in there. And there's some that maybe I did, but there's a lot of it. Monkey flower and, and stuff. It's, yeah, it's, but in uplands, you usually don't. Usually things are bad in uplands. If something's coming in, it's weed, mainly, yeah. And somebody else had a question, and I didn't. Was it you who had, had your hand? All right. Okay, now you got to tell, what, before the last question, what am I going to get out of this talk? What's, what's the part that you're going like, oh, you didn't need that? Huh? <laughs> You're just going to let me do it, huh? Maybe it's you go.
Like, exactly. And what I have read and um, look back at my training is that's not part of a remediation. So it's continued pollution. Is that being watched at other stations? Is that part of well, Joe tells me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't look too good to me either, but there you go. No, it, it is, right? What? Recontamination from coming down. Historic, yeah. No, they did. Yeah, actually, the name that for storm drain was adopted by each view, depending on the site. It's uh, like rainwater flows through and it goes down the creek and it is still polluting the creek. Yeah. It is, and that's part of what is still being worked on on that, is uh, how to control stormwater. It's actually the largest. Great, anyway, one more question. Did you, did you, coffee cup guy, did you have a question? No? I thought you were gesturing to me. Maybe it was a different kind of gesture. Okay. <laughs> you want to remember one other thing? There's no overarching concept. It's a thousand messy facts, and you got to know as many as you can. That's my way of looking at revegetation. Hey, thank you, folks. Appreciate you coming. Yeah. Thirty-six minutes, thirty seconds. I don't think I. I don't think I.